Okay, so uh, this video is based on organic growth. I've already done videos on external growth of a couple of methods of, of acquisitions and mergers, including horizontal integration and vertical integration. But organic growth, this is also known as internal growth. So what I mean by internal growth is the business uses its own resources to grow. So it's not via the help of other companies, but they use their own resources or they invest in their own resources to increase output uh, and also to increase sales. So when I'm talking about output, that could be, an example could be investing into new capital goods, so new machinery, and in doing so, they can produce a greater output, which then can be sold. Um, in terms of sales, it could be investing within their marketing and increasing their marketing budget to try and increase the amount of sales. But what we'll do within this video is we'll look at very, very specific strategies and examples, real life examples, uh, based on those strategies. But to begin with, let's have a look at uh, the benefits of organic growth. So to begin with, when we're comparing it to external growth, it's much lower risk. If you think about external growth, you are merging, you're acquiring a completely different company. And, and that's that's very, very risky because this new company, you've, you've got very well, no inside knowledge of the company. You don't know if they're compatible. You don't know if they'll work. And also the sheer cost of that merger or acquisition can be incredibly high. But with organic growth, because you're using your own resources to begin with, you, it's much more calculated, it's much more measured, and you can do it at your own pace. So, for example, if you wanted just to start off with, maybe you're a small company and you wanted to take uh, low-risk strategies, you can do that. If you are, your brand was much more well-known and you're a bigger company but you're still looking to organically grow, then obviously you can take that risk, but you can decide, you can calculate that risk. And sometimes with external growth, yes, you can calculate the risk, but the risk, there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, and that can be... Um, and, and that can be, obviously, um, well, it can lead to even greater failure, and especially when we think about the cost involved, as I said before. Now, another, another benefit of organic growth is it often builds upon the brand's strength already. So that could be in terms of their existing products. It could be in terms of their existing markets. It could be just little tweaks to their products or to their markets just to try and increase their sales a little bit further. And again, we'll look at that. But with organic growth, yes, there's benefits, but there's also drawbacks as well. There's also issues. And again, when we're comparing it to external growth, um, it depends on the objective of the company and the entrepreneur, but it is much slower. And what you tend to find is the lower the risk, the lower the return. Um, and that might be the same with organic growth. So what you might find is you might have a major, major company, a very, very well-known brand, and they might already be market leader. And you might think, well, how else, how can they organically grow even further? It might be very, very difficult to do so. But if they've still got that aim that they want to grow and they want to expand even further, they might actually have no other option but to externally grow. And therefore, sometimes organic growth, even though it's, it's considered to be more sustainable, it's also got limitations as well. So what we're going to do to begin with is we're going to look at some real life examples. Now, um, with organic growth, I'm going to focus on, on sales to begin with. I'm going to look at marketing, but I'm going to relate it to um, a concept which is studied in A-level known, known as the Ansoff Matrix, because I do think the Ansoff Matrix really links well to organic growth, because a lot of the strategies within the Ansoff Matrix are organic growth strategies. So to begin with, what we're going to look at is something known as market penetration. I'm just going to show you a quick example of one strategy that a company could use. that video uh, it was obviously the, the Christmas advertisement for uh, Coca-Cola and advertisement is an example of market penetration 
Now, what market penetration is, is strengthening sales in the current market with the current products. So, for example, with Coke, the original Coca-Cola, what they're trying to do is they're trying to carry out this Christmas advertisement campaign just to kind of increase their sales even further over the Christmas period. And also, the Christmas advert is, is, well, is, is well known and everybody expects to see it. But advertisement's one example. There's lots of different examples as well. You can think about sales promotions. So it could be, uh, for example, buy one, get one free, or discounts, or something along the lines just to try and increase their sales of their existing products that they've already got. Now, the reason why they do that is, number one, to try and attract new customers. Even if, for example, Coca-Cola has been out in the market for a very long time, and you might think to yourself, well, are they actually really going to attract new customers? You, you have to think about it from a point of view of, these customers may have switched previously to their competitors. And what Coca-Cola might be trying to do is get them back. So for example, if a customer switched to Pepsi and they start to buy Pepsi, well that's, that's a sale that's been lost from Coke. So Coke might be trying to get them back and bring them back into, uh, obviously, their customer base. Another one is, is sometimes maybe customers just need reminding. Yeah, you might get a customer who, they do buy Coke, they prefer Coke to Pepsi, but maybe they just haven't bought Coca-Cola for a while. Um, and offering something, for example, like an advertisement, or maybe a loyalty card for, a, for a, a certain company, or maybe a sales promotion, or whatever it might be, it just reminds them that, ah, okay, yeah, actually, I might, subconsciously, I might buy that product again. And because it's an existing product, and because it's in an existing market, it's, much, it's, it's less expensive. They don't have to develop new products. They don't have to um, research new geographical um, areas. They're simply uh, paying for certain strategies, and, and those strategies, they will differ in cost. So, for example, that television advert is going to be much more expensive than, um, let's say, a, a small company just put a poster up in the window. There is going to be a difference in cost, but when we're looking at alternative strategies, market penetration is often less expensive. Right, okay, so um, another one that we're going to look at is known as product development. Now, product development is um, it's in the same market, but it's developing brand new products. So you may think, well, is Diet Coke, is it really a new product? Is Coke Life a brand new product? It is, because it's not the original Coke. Coca-Cola have developed it. Um, they've, they've changed the, the flavor, they've changed the packaging, they've changed the design, they've changed everything about the original Coke, and they've brought this new product out called, for example, Coke Life. Now, the reason why companies such as Coke do this um, is because they're trying to target new market segments. And what I mean by market segment is a, a different group of customer. Now, that different group of customer can be um, it can be targeted for lots of different reasons. It could be, for example, based on uh, health and fitness. So what Kirk have done with, for example, Diet Coke is they've they've aimed it at customers who actually they are they are considerate about the amount of sugar they intake, and they are worried about the fattening elements of Coca Cola, and and therefore they won't buy Coca Cola. And Coke do not want to lose that customer, and therefore they want to target the health-minded customer via these different, I suppose, healthy alternatives to Coke, such as the likes of Diet Coke. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to make sure that they do not lose out on any customers, and they appeal to a, a diverse range of customers and lots of different customer groups to increase that customer base. It can also increase competitiveness for a company. So, for example, if Pepsi have already done this, they've already brought out, uh, they've developed new flavors, and those new flavors are very, very popular. Well, Coca-Cola don't want to not do that because then they'll, they're going to lose sales because they're going to lose that competitiveness. So sometimes it is also to kind of make sure that you are either ahead of competitors or you're staying in line with competitors. And uh, the final the final reason is, is to, to widen your brand exposure. Get that brand name out there on lots of different products. Now, another benefit that I haven't talked about actually on the slide, but you could also talk about, is economies of scope. Now, within the um, within the horizontal integration video, I've talked about economies of scope more. But let's imagine that uh, you've got a company and they've got machinery, they've got capital goods, and they've been producing their usual product, and then all of a sudden they develop new flavors. The chances are they'll probably still be able to use that machinery. So now that machinery, that those capital goods, are able to produce lots of different products at the same time, which becomes much more efficient when trying to obviously um, use that capital good for output to then be sold. Now it does have issues. There are, there are problems with product development, and I'll show this a little bit more in an example that I'm going to show you, a video on Coca-Cola and their development of new products, but it's a risk. And the risk is it's a brand new product. 
Coca-Cola will carry out market research and there is the cost of market research and hopefully the market research will um, give them that winning formula but sometimes these products fail. Even with market research these products fail and they don't really take off. It's also the cost of research and developing the product itself because they have to experiment with all these different flavours. They have to experiment um, in terms of what the product will look like, what the product will taste like and what the product will be actually like. Um, so when we're looking at issues, I think uh, the next video that I'm going to show you really highlights the benefits but also the possible limitations or drawbacks. We're trying to be bold with trialing different flavors. It's also a test and learn for us. That's a culture we're trying to create. Cleaner, fuller, more natural cola taste. Coke is it. It's a hit. It's a Coke. Coke is it. Our freestyle technology is actually a really great platform for us to get real-time feedback from the consumer. They can actually mix and make their own product. So Sprite Cherry, for example, was launched uh, mass because it was created frequently in the freestyle platform. Once we identify a concept, we will make sure that it's real. So we've got a platform, for example, that reaches up to 80,000 consumers, and we look at this segment that we're trying to target for specific products and brands, and we will have a dialogue with them. We'll try to understand, you know, does this concept work? Is it the right flavor? not waiting until we have everything right to launch. We're trying to be agile where we can. We're trying to say, what are the smart risks we might need to take, but what are the areas that we can just go fast on? Because as the consumers continue to evolve and they're looking for different things all the time, we want to be there right, right there with them. I don't think people were ready to have a coffee portfolio within the Coca-Cola brand. Uh, having said that, now we've come back with a very similar product, but we called it Coca-Cola Coffee. And it's been launching in Australia, in New Zealand, it's launched in Vietnam, for example. It's doing extremely well. The third strategy is market development, and that is where you strengthen sales of existing products but in brand new markets. Now, what I mean by market, a market is where obviously you've got your, your buyer and your seller and they are meeting for that transaction. So when I'm talking about a new market, we're talking about a new, uh, maybe a new way of buying that product. Now, usually that is, for example, in shops in different geographical areas. So if you think about, for example, McDonald's, McDonald's have been amazing at this and they've done it via a franchise model, but they, they operate in over 100 countries. And they've been able to rapidly expand via market development because of that franchise me uh, method with franchisees buying the rights to use the license of McDonald's. But it could also be um, in electronic ways. So, for example, with e-commerce or m-commerce. And what's been interesting, I suppose, over um, this COVID pandemic is the amount of smaller companies that are realizing that they have to develop their market and they have to think of new ways to reach their customers. They're still, they're still selling the same products, but they're knowing that because of lockdown and customers not able to actually access their stores perhaps, they've had to do it via delivery and they've had to set up a website and that would be market development. So I've got the example, I know it's a major company, but Domino's. Domino's have invested a lot in their M-commerce, so their mobile phone technology. And I mean, if you've used the Domino's app before, it gives you a lot of information about the preparation of the meal in terms of what you can order, how long before you can maybe pick it up or it'll be delivered. And it's, I'd probably argue it's a very, very, very good app and maybe one of the best apps in that type of uh, sector, in that industry. Now, 
obviously it can reach new geographic areas. If you set up a shop in a new location where they've never been before, then obviously you've got those customers can, that now can access it. If you're setting up a, an app, now you've got customers with a smartphone who can order it very, very easily. Um, if you've got, for example, um, a company that is just known for one country and they move into a new country, then again, you're accessing a completely different customer base, but with your existing products. And, and in doing so, you're obviously going to increase your customer base by targeting all these new customers, and that will widen your brand exposure as well. Now again, there is risks, and it's the cost of market research, it's the cost of setting up in these new locations. The Domino's app will require investment into that capital. Um, again, if you think about um, some companies that are setting up their own shops and not using the franchise method, well then again, they have to pay for everything that's related to that new shop, whether that's rent, um, in terms of new employees. So it can be expensive, um, but again, if we're comparing it to alternatives and we're comparing it to, for example, external growth and buying a completely new company, sorry, a different company, then the costs, they don't really compare. Now I'm going to show you just a quick example of how the Domino's app is used and how they advertised it to, to, to really, I suppose, bring about more customers. Ever Domino's Pizza Online Ordering, now with an app. Download now and order with a tap. Delivery easy. At Domino's Pizza, we deliver delights online. The final strategy I'm going to look at is probably the most risky, and it's, it's, a, it's a high risk strategy of diversification. Just like when we were looking at external growth, a conglomerate integration was the most risky, and um, it's because they've got similar characteristics. Now, with a conglomerate merger, when they were externally growing, they were buying a company in a completely different industry, all right, and, and that's why it was risky. With diversification as an organic growth strategy, what they're doing is they're developing a brand new product in a completely different market, and that's where the risk is involved. Because not only do you have to carry out the market research into the market, but you also have to carry out the, the, the research and the development into the new product as well. But if it's done successfully, then it can completely um, revolutionize your revenue streams. It can bring in a completely new revenue stream, which you never, uh, I suppose you never expected to, to bring in. Because you're entering a completely different market with a completely different product, and therefore you've got a completely different customer base. And that customer base will obviously increase that revenue and that turnover. And, and again, it can widen your brand image with industries that you've not previously been associated with. Now, of course, there's a risk involved within that because you might think, well, will customers buy those products if you're not associated with it? But if you've got a pretty strong brand image anyway, it won't take long before all of a sudden now it is associated with that new product. And Samsung is a brilliant example because Samsung, not only, I mean, we might consider them just to be in terms of electronic devices with mobile phones and smartphones, but they do a, a range of different products and they sell in lots of different industries. I'm going to give you one example now.